I'm not used to calling the audience boys and girls, so I think I'll call you ladies and gentlemen, okay? So, uh, my name is Yoshiro Azuma. I am a visiting professor here at uh, the uh, Indian Institute of uh, Technology in Delhi. And, uh, well, uh, uh, my other affiliations include uh, Sophia University in Japan and uh, uh, the Higher Energy Physics Lab in Tsukuba and a, 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 a large lab, a scientific lab nearby Tokyo called Riken. So today, the uh, title of this presentation is called Modern Science in Japan and in India, Past, Present, and a Great Future. Yeah, there are lots of things to uh, yeah, uh, talk about in this uh, uh, subject, actually. But, uh, well, I started preparing rather late uh, in, uh, uh, while in Agenda the last few days. So, uh, well, and uh, as I prepare, I also realize that you perhaps know a lot better, especially about India. So, uh, I have decided to talk more about my own research subject, which of course I know better. And then towards the end, I will make a few comments about Japanese science and Indian science, okay? So, uh, uh, I, I, I hope you would, ah, just one moment, yeah. would you mind uh, if I take a picture from you guys? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so let me just uh, continue. Uh, well, let's put this in slideshow mode. Introduction. Well, I work at a place called Gakushin University in Tokyo, uh, uh, when I, where I obtained my Bachelor of Science. Oh, this was a long time ago, around the time when your parents were born, perhaps. <laughs> okay, and then I did uh, my PhD at the University of Oregon in the United States, and then postdoc at the beautiful, beautiful city of Vancouver, British Columbia. And then I was a staff scientist at the United States government lab called Argonne Lab, nearby Chicago. Then I returned to Japan and worked at a, a high energy accelerator lab in Tsukuba. And uh, so most of my career, I worked at uh, uh, natural labs. Well, I spent a long time at Argonne and High Energy Accelerator lab, lab. 
I wanted to teach also at a university, so fairly late in my career, I moved to Sophia University in Tokyo, and then, uh, well, uh, and then I retired from Sophia University, uh, that's mandatory, you see, and then I came to Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, here, where uh, I'm very pleased that I'm not, re I'm retired in Japan, but I'm not retired in India. And uh, I'm very grateful to the hospitality of this place and uh, also uh, great to have the chance to meet you guys in high school, okay? Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, actually this is my first time, I think, to talk to high school students. Uh, well. Uh, but a long time ago, I was also a high school student, perhaps a little before your parents were born. So uh, but I will try to remember what sort of things I thought and what I knew in those days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so what do I specialize in? Uh, I am in physics, okay? I am in very basic physics of atomic and molecular uh, spectroscopy. Uh, just one moment, it didn't move, did it? Ah. Let me just uh, do this all over again. I'm going to shut down this program and, uh, uh, sorry, and uh, bring this up again. And then I go to, I hope this will allow me to go to slideshow mode from the current slide. Oh, okay. And now I think I get my, can get my cursor out. Oh yeah, okay, okay, very good. Okay, so, uh, so, yeah, I was just reading this page. Okay, and uh, so I had a fairly international career, uh, both in Japan, in the United States, and now in India, and I did a lot of my experiments and uh, research also in Europe. And I feel one of the most interesting things to do uh, uh, in working in uh, forefront science and technology especially with uh, large facilities like I did, was that I got the chance to work with so many different people all over the world. The uh, science is really very international, yeah. And uh, uh, I enjoy my friendship with international students and scientists all over the world just as much as I enjoy research itself, yeah. And uh, so, I, as I said, I specialize in atomic and molecular physics with synchrotron radiation. And to be more, a little more specific, I work with uh, uh, atomic and molecular spectroscopy with synchrotron, uh, synchrotron radiation. Earlier, I worked with lasers, but I wanted much higher energy light so uh, later in my career, I have been working with what is called synchrotron radiation. Okay, how many of you have heard the word synchrotron radiation? Raise your hand if you have. Oh, okay. It's not, uh, it's not very well known around here in India, I suppose. But there is a really wonderful synchrotron radiation facility also in India. I'll talk about it a little bit later. And I work in a field in, uh, in particular called atomic and molecular spectroscopy. Okay, and I will explain this uh, about this in another uh, 20 or uh, 30 minutes, okay? And uh, well, so let's take a look at what the synchrotron radiation facility looks like. This is the place uh, where I used to work for uh, more than a dozen years in the, the high energy physics lab in, in Scuba, uh, very close to uh, Mount Scuba, you can see up here. There, there's a large accelerator facility 
which uh, is used to collide, uh, okay, collide electrons and positrons to work on experimental facility, uh, on high energy physics experiment. But there is also a synchrotron radiation facility, this round facility here, uh, which was built in the 1980s, used to be the best facility in the world. And uh, that, uh, this, uh, there I, I spent a dozen years, uh, and uh, uh, well, that was actually my motivation for coming back to Japan after spending many years in the United States. And uh, 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 it's situated in the very pleasant countryside uh, north of Tokyo. Uh, let's just look at another synchrotron radiation facility. This is the Advanced Phonon Source at Argonne, Illinois. Again, a uh, round facility. This is a huge one, okay? And uh, uh, ele electrons keep going around this facility at the speed of light, okay? Well, not exactly the speed of light, but extremely close to the speed of light. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is another facility at Berkeley, uh, uh, California. It's on top of the hill behind the University of California Berkeley campus. It's such a beautiful place. You can see, uh, uh, see, uh, have a view of all over the uh, San Francisco Bay and uh, actually uh, to the right uh, around here is the city of San Francisco. And uh, uh, I also work at the Synchron Radiation Facility called Soleil in, well, in the suburbs of, uh, of uh, Paris. Do you know, do you happen to know what Soleil means in French? Yeah? It means brightness. It also means the sun. Yes, that's right. So it has a rather, yeah, poetic Frenchish name for uh, an experimental facility. Yes. And uh, then, uh, now this is the largest synchrotron radiation facility in, uh, in the world. It is in Japan at, at a place called Harima which is actually far from Tokyo, closer to uh, the Kansai area, uh, uh, Osaka and Kobe and those cities. But it's in the mountains, okay? And it's around facilities like this. And uh, then there is uh, actually a, a very long, what's called a beamline facility. If I have time, I'll explain a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, as I told you, there is a synchrotron complex in uh, the Raja Ramana Center for Advanced Technology in Indore, India. This is an excellent facility. I I uh, went there uh, and uh, had a look at it. The only, uh, 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 only uh, disappointing thing was that uh, foreigners are not allowed to do experiments there. Oh. Quite disappointing <laughs> because I was uh, actually secretly hoping to get involved in this facility. Uh, the reason is, uh, I think, because uh, it's uh, under the jurisdiction of uh, the Department of Atomic Energy, which also uh, uh, deals with a lot of uh, uh, well classified research and all that. But you know, it, uh, but, but, and of course, there are many other. Uh, types of not synchrotron but accelerator facility, such as the Inter University Accelerator Center, mm -hmm. right nearby uh, my this mm -hmm. place, where the accelerators are open to any proposals from anybody at an accredited university or uh, uh, or a research lab. And uh, well, that's the way it should be. And uh, well, I hope uh, after uh, when you guys. Uh, uh, grow up and have e enough influence. I hope uh, uh, you can make uh, the synchrotron facility available uh, to everybody in the world as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's what's really fun in synchrotron facilities, working with people from all over the world. Okay, so I was say saying synchrotron radiation, synchrotron radiation, and uh, showing you the buildings. I haven't really explained to you what it actually does. 
Uh, well, should we get on to this? Oh yeah, well, what? So this is, it. I do spectroscopic work with atoms and, ex atoms and molecules. <coughs> and what is spectroscopy? Well, let's get back to the very beginning. Okay, have you seen a picture like this? This is a prison, okay? And, uh, and uh, if you uh, shine a beam of the sunlight onto the, uh, onto the set prison, oh, you can see the seven color, colors of the rainbow. Yeah, uh, you know why? Well, uh, uh, I suppose you may have learned how it works uh, through the uh, dispersion in the uh, uh, refraction index of uh, glass or uh, crystals. Uh, maybe some of you have already learned that. And uh, so, uh, well, so uh, Newton uh, saw this, yes, and he was so in in impressed. He called this the spectrum. Yeah, the so of the sun, the solar spectrum. What is spectrum? The name spectrum derives from the Latin word specto. Specto means to see. Yeah. So uh, simply to see. Uh, and uh, he saw these beautiful colors lined up uh, and uh, saw called this uh, spectrum because uh, because he was really impressed by what he saw yeah and uh, actually uh, uh, actually a lot of words in science is derived from uh, words in latin such as specto and uh, and uh, uh, well if you learn latin you will start learning yeah how all these uh, many of these scientific world words relate to various things in the world or objects uh, you're familiar with uh, so, uh, but, uh, well, maybe you are busy learning Sanskrit as well. That's also a very good thing. Oh, how many of you learn Sanskrit? Okay, uh, quite a few. I'm very glad to see that because uh, uh, that is the language in which you see, you, you can learn a lot of the classical tradition of India. And uh, well, and it's like that in uh, Europe with, uh, well, uh, in the West with uh, Latin, okay. Okay, so, so question, was uh, Newton the first guy who saw this uh, solar spectrum? Well, I suppose not, the seven colors of, of, of the sun, uh, of the sunlight. Uh, going through the crystal must have seen, but been seen by many people, including our ancestor, uh, tens of thousands of years ago. <laughs> I'm sure about that. And uh, this lady named Cleopatra, Queen of Egypt, yeah, uh, liked it very much. He was hanging crystals and prisms in uh, a dark chamber, and in living light, coming in and saw the beautiful colors and uh, and uh, was uh, uh, re uh, was really happy about that and uh, almost danced around danced around in it. Yeah. So uh, so what was different with the discovery of Newton was that well probably uh, Cleopatra thought the colors were produced by the crystals through some sort of magic and uh, but. Uh, 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 Newton correctly uh, reasoned with a few extra experiments like uh, uh, slipping off red uh, of a single color and getting it through another prism or actually dispersing it another in another uh, direction uh, uh, by using uh, uh, another prism and uh, concentrating it uh, to one spot again and seeing lights, uh, light, uh, white light and all that. And he correctly reasoned that uh, these, uh, it's not that uh, uh, the, the prism has uh, uh, produced the, uh, 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 the different colors with some sort of magic, but actually it was all in the light to begin with, and it was just a superposition of, of light. Okay, the next step happened when uh, 
Uh, fellow uh, 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 son, uh, well, Newton lived in the 17th century. In the 18th century, somebody named Fraunhofer in Netherland uh, took a more careful look at this solar spectrum and saw some of these dark lines appearing in the spectrum. Okay. This especially, uh, uh, and, and he actually saw several, a good number of lines. And of course he had no, no idea whatsoever about what they are. So what did he do? He simply called them A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and a few other letters are missing, but K and so. Okay, so uh, these dark lines are called Fraunhofer lines, okay? Uh, what, what are the, or, why are they there? Do you know what, oh yeah, tell me. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's basically because, yeah, atoms. And in this particular case, it's sodium. Okay, sodium in the solar atlas is in the solar atmosphere, apparently, and the light passes through it, and uh, then it actually uh, uh, absorbs a particular orange wavelength. Okay, so then, uh, so the light coming to uh, you to, on Earth has this uh, orange part missing. Okay. And that's why you have a dark line here. Okay, yeah. And uh, so, but uh, Fraunhofer did not understand that. He had no idea about it. Yes, and uh, it remained a mystery for a little while, but pretty soon people realized that. Well, they started working on what's called flame reaction or emission lines. And if you heat up, yeah, uh, 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 sodium in uh, sodium in a flame, uh, you see very bright lines exactly corresponding to the wavelength of the D line. Okay, and that's how they uh, and so that the match was so exact that uh, he had to, he had to reason that oh this must be uh, 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 this is what appears in the uh, uh, high, uh, heated uh, sodium. It must be something that uh, that uh, it must be the same uh, same something with sodium that causes this dark line in the solar spectrum as well. And uh, and he reasoned that correctly. But why? But of course, nobody understood. Nobody understood why these absorptions or emissions happen at uh, the uh, uh, wavelength or color specific to uh, sodium. And uh, well, if you look at the flame reaction, there are some extra lines that appear only in the flame reaction, but not in the absorption spectrum. Isn't that interesting? And uh, 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 I won't talk about why, but uh, if, you, if you're interested, uh, you can talk to me later, okay? And uh, why are these emission lines uh, themselves, uh, lines formed? Well, it's because of uh, quantum mechanics, actually. And in quantum mechanics, yeah, uh, the electrons in microscopic, uh, uh, microscopic uh, things like atoms, okay? They obey quantum mechanics, not classical mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, for reasons that will are well become more easier to understand if you study a little more. You the uh, energy of the the atoms and molecules can only have separate, different, discrete levels. Okay, and uh, light is uh, emitted or absorbed only uh, with the with the with, with the photon energy uh, uh, matching those uh, the intervals of those levels oh boy i said photon energy 
Well, what is, uh, what do I mean by that? Ah, what is light? What is light? What? Yeah. Light is a quantized form of energy. Yes, you're right. There are many, but there are many uh, quantized form of energy. Actually, almost every particles <laughs> are proton or electron or whatever. Uh, that, but, but that's right. Yes. And uh, uh, can anybody tell me a little more? Yes. Uh, then light is can be photon, can be DNA. So it depends on the particular we are. Yes, that is right. Light is, yeah, light can be a wave or a particle. And that duality, yes, uh, I, I, I can see that many of you have already learned about it. Uh, but uh, I'm sure you feel that it's uh, very mysterious. Yeah, and uh, you will understand even better uh, once you go to college and study quantum mechanics, okay? So, light is a wave and also uh, 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 a particle with discrete energy. And, they, and uh, that energy depends on uh, the frequency or, in other words, also the wavelength of the light. So, uh, 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 all, mo most of the atoms and molecules have these signatures called uh, uh, transition between the uh, energy levels, which, uh, which uh, uh, allows them to absorb or emit particular types of particular value of uh, uh, photon energy, or in other words, a particular uh, particular wavelength, or in, a, in other words, a particular color. Okay? Yeah, and I'm impressed you all know all of that. Yes. So, uh, you can, uh, well, uh, this is uh, in various experiments. If you have pure white light, the spectrum is uh, uh, continuous, uh, uh, continuously exhibits the uh, uh, spectrum of the uh, 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 of a uh, uh, rainbow, and if you have heated gas, you have a uh, transition coming up from coming from higher levels of the atom to the lower levels of the atom, which would uh, allow uh, uh, the emission of particular, very particular wavelengths. Uh, but uh, then you can uh, uh, do what's called absorption spectroscopy. Uh, shining, uh, shining uh, white light through a pocket, through some gas sample, and then after it got through that last sample, a gas sample, the gas might absorb some very particular uh, wavelengths, uh, uh, which is a signature of each particular uh, element. And uh, this uh, phenomena uh, was uh, there uh, was. Uh, for more than a hundred years. Nobody understood why, but this phenomena uh, of this uh, characteristic signature of light for each element we became a very important tool in what's called analytical chemistry. Okay, what is, what's the nature of these uh, lines? Well, came only after the understanding of uh, the discovery of quantum mechanics, which explains the those existence of those energy levels that uh, uh, you uh, we we were just talking about. Uh, okay. Well, I just thought, what is what is the simplest atom you think? Hydrogen. Yes, hydrogen atom. So I will just like to show you uh, uh, a simulation of an experiment with hydrogen atom uh, utilizing the uh, simulation uh, effect interactive simulations. How many of you know about this? Ah, some of you know about this. This this is uh, very good. Yeah, uh, it was developed originally by. Uh, uh, a friend of mine, actually, named uh, uh, Carl Wyman, 
at, uh, uh, at the uh, University of Colorado. He later obtained the Nobel Prize and then moved to uh, British Columbia. But the SPECT simulation is excellent, and I'm really glad that your uh, teacher has been using it for, for you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, let's just take one look at it. Uh, so, you guys probably know how to access this. Uh, uh, Google FET, P-H-E-T, and University of Colorado, and you can find this easily, and you can even uh, download all of these uh, simulations for free. And uh, the, uh, uh, my particular favorite, favorite is uh, called Quantum Ground States, but today, I think I would like to show, uh, to look at you, at uh, what's called the uh, quantum uh, model of the hydrogen atom. Prediction in white monochromatic and show the And uh, okay, so uh, how many of you have seen this uh, this particular simulation? Okay, but many of you know where FET is, so you can find this easily. So what is an atom? Yeah, uh, well, Greek philosophers uh, said it, it's a tiny little particle, yeah, like a ball. So, like a billiard ball. So, uh, well, that's the extent of the understanding, and actually, under, until fairly recently, until the uh, mid uh, uh, 19th century or so. But towards the end of 19th century, a fellow named uh, 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 J.J. Thompson said that it, it uh, actually is uh, because they, the particle called electron was discovered, uh, there is uh, 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 there must be an electron in, in the neutral atom. And then there must be a cloud of a uh, uh, positive uh, proton around it. That was the understanding of J.J. Thompson. But then, uh, uh, then a fellow named Ras Rutherford did an experiment uh, on uh, uh, and find out that there is a tight positive core in the atom. There must be a tight positive core in the atom and called it a proton. And then a fellow named. Uh, Nanaoka, Hantaro Nanaoka in Japan, uh, who for some reason did not get an Nobel Prize, I don't know why, uh, said in, uh, towards the end of the 19th century that uh, uh, it, uh, 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 then it must be a hard core with, uh, uh, with an electron going around it, okay? That's called the classical solar system. Okay, and this is what happens, okay? Ha, ah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the, the classical planetary system is not feasible. Why is that? Because electron will go around, okay? An electron goes, if electron goes around, well, it emits uh, photons, okay? Because it's an accelerating particle, and it goes uh, and uh, uh, accelerating charge. Ha, ah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, how do you produce uh, light? How is light produced? Can anybody answer? Yeah, please. But by the movement of that by the movement of photons. Yeah, the photons is light, but photons or electric magnetic waves are produced by what? Yeah. Acceleration of the charges. Acceleration of the charges. That's right. Movement alone would not do. But the acceleration of the charges can produce photons. And uh, you may have learned in physics, a circular orbit is actually an acceleration. It's being uh, in motion. Okay? The speed is the same, but it is accelerating. Uh, but, well, it, it doesn't follow a line, right? But circular orbit. What is a circular orbit? It's a continuous 
uh, uh, acceleration towards the center that keeps going on and on and on as long as the orbit is long. And then that means that it emits uh, radiation. That means that electrons going around the, uh, the proton will emit radiation and electrons are going to fall into uh, the proton. So that's the end of it and that's, uh, that's, that's the end of it. Okay, yeah, synchrotron radiation too. I'm going to tell you a little later. Electrons are going around the great cir cir uh, circularly orbit, orbit uh, 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 that are that could be uh, a, a kilometer long. Okay, and uh, they are emitting extremely strong X-rays. Okay, in the case of atoms, it could be visible to uh, to uh, near ultraviolet. Okay, so then comes Bohr's model. Yeah, well, the, look at the different colors, different colors belonging to different uh, uh, energy. And uh, the electrons are get, is, uh, is getting excited to different orbits, okay? Oh, how fun. Okay, what did uh, Bohr say? say? He actually, from the, from, uh, 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 well, since we know today, it doesn't seem like he, uh, did a lot, but he just said that electrons occupy certain discrete orbital following a certain rule. Uh, maybe you already know about the rules as well, but that's all he said. So, well, well, you, maybe you can call that a discovery, but uh, well, actually it's uh, just description of uh, what seems to happen. Yeah, okay. And uh, the body had a more sophisticated idea about why that harm happens. Yeah, uh, uh, electrons can ex uh, uh, exist uh, in, with the uh, with the combination of the wavelength and uh, uh, the proper connection of the uh, uh, wave uh, within that orbital uh, properly achieved. Okay, well, I suggest you to take a look at this later at home if you have access to uh, a, a computer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, the radial uh, 3D view of this is very interesting. Yeah, look at that. Okay, there's a lot that you can think and learn uh, uh, from the, just from this uh, simulation that I can tell you in, in less than a minute. Uh, so, and Schrodinger then said that the orbits actually are not uh, clearly defined as cl like classical orbits, but then uh, uh, it's a, it uh, expands as a probability distribution through a wave function. Uh, that can be, it is really hard to uh, illustrate, but it's uh, uh, illustrated like a cloud here. Okay, so, uh, so, so this is so much fun. And, uh, well, since I, sh uh, uh, I showed you uh, the uh, uh, simulation, uh, the FET simulation of the atom, I think I'd like to show you the simulation uh, of, for the synchrotron radiation as well. Okay, this is a simulation called radiation to two-dimensional, uh, 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 developed by my colleague named uh, Tsumoru Shintake in Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in, in Japan. I'm sorry, unlike the fifth simulation, this is not available. It used to be available on uh, on the internet. But suddenly, Shintake got the idea that he wants to make money out of this, so <laughs> he made this unavailable, and I think he is going to uh, sell it commercial. At this moment, uh, you can't uh, fetch it or buy it or anything, but I hope it becomes <laughs> commercially available at a relatively low price. Uh, okay, so what is this? What is this? What is this that you see? Any guess? Atom? Okay, well, it could be an atom. Sir, radiation are uh, produced by the source in two, di two dimensional plane. Yeah, pre pretty close. Well, it could actually be anything. Uh, this is a crude picture, so you can explain it. <laughs> uh, all sorts of things. But uh, 
I think this is meant to be the, th the thing at the center. The thing at the center is an electric charge, okay? Electric charge in particular. Let's think this is an electron if we're going to talk about synchron radiation. Okay, so what's around the charge? This, is this, these are called electric field lines. And I think you, you learn about electric field lines and magnetic field lines as well. Or, or do you? It's less and less popular. You, you know why? Because, uh, uh, well, in college you will learn vector analysis and, uh, and you will learn all about uh, uh, Maxwell's equation and electromagnetic uh, induction and all that. And so, uh, well, electricity and magnetism is described in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, vector analysis rather than field lines. But field lines are a lot more uh, uh, visually fun to, to look at. Its defect is that it cannot, uh, uh, you, you can have, a, uh, 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 you can describe magnetic statics and electrostatics, but uh, it uh, is difficult for it to uh, explain any electromagnetic induction, okay? And electromagnetic induction is all there is to the generation of light. Okay, we said accelerating charged particle produces light. How does it produce light? Because it, uh, 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 it uh, produces... Uh, uh, Oscill uh, oscillation or change in uh, electric field around it, okay? And if an uh, uh, electric field oscillates like that, what is that going to do by electric, mo uh, 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 electric uh, magnetic induction? Oscillating electric fields, okay, are going, to, are going to induce oscillating magnetic field. Okay, and then the oscillating magnetic field will induce oscillating electric field. And then oscillating electric field will induce oscillating magnetic field. And so on and so forth. And it travels all through uh, the, all through the, the universe. Okay, that way. Uh, uh, well, uh, inducing each other through electromagnetic uh, in induction. Okay, and... Uh, yeah, that's the nature of light. So uh, what we want to try here is let's uh, shake this charge. Boing, 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 boing. Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, uh, you are looking at, uh, yeah, you can imagine the, uh, you can imagine the uh, electric, uh, oh, uh, thank you very much. You can imagine the field lines having tension and waves are uh, uh, emanating from the uh, this oscillation at the center, okay? Yeah, and these waves are moving. You might think it's slowly, but that's the speed of light, okay? That's the speed of light. Okay, I'm tired of doing this with my hands, so let's, uh, 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 let's do it in some uh, different manner, uh, automatically. Uh, how do I do this automatically? Uh, so. Uh, trajectory, uh, oh yeah, line and uh, oh well, I, I think I made a mistake. Uh, this is not what I wanted to show. Uh, dipole oscillation, yeah. Okay, I'm tired of shaking it, so I'm, uh, yeah, doing this uh, uh, this uh, uh, automatically. And this is the most typical form of uh, light generation called, uh, well, di through dipole oscillation. This is a simple harmonic oscillator with a charge at the center, and it's uh, it's uh, uh, oscillating up and down and producing. Uh, uh, producing uh, 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 producing a field. Okay, if the uh, dipole uh, moment uh, oscillation uh, uh, produces a, a, a electric field, uh, I, I mean light. Of course, so does circular motion, right? 
and circular motion can all easily be uh, described by the superposition of perpendicular uh, oscillations, okay? Maybe you did that in some exercise problem, a superposition of, uh, yeah, uh, uh, vertical, vertical oscillation and, and uh, uh, horizontal oscillation with a phase difference by uh, by uh, by uh, uh, by uh, by quarter pi can produce uh, uh, oscillation. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. circular oscillation. Okay, so uh, then let's look at the circular. Oh, my God, I didn't uh, want to show this right away. Uh, circle and uh, well, let's make it a lot slower. Okay, this is, this is the uh, circular, uh, the circular motion of the particle. And uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but uh, it's uh, producing uh, light that uh, uh, mostly goes up outward, yeah, and uh, 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 from the whole circle. And uh, it's, uh, well, this is how uh, 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 the kind of radiation that comes from a circular uh, uh, trajectory when the particle is relatively slow. It's actually just a superposition of two dipole oscillations. Okay, and the situation changes quite a bit. When, let's change the speed of the particle and uh, now make it uh, 0 0.99, 0 0.99 times the speed of light. And what happens? This is what happens. Wow, it looks totally different, doesn't it? This is called synchrotron radiation, okay? This is synchrotron radiation. You do, do you see what happens? Okay, you, the light is actually, which way do you think light is coming out? What? Outwards? Okay, yeah. That's what it looks like, but that's not the case. It's coming out tangentially, okay? Tangentially along the circumstance, okay? Look carefully. Yeah. Uh, do you see? Yeah. Look at this position, okay? This is a charged particle, an electron bunch come, moving around. And look at this particular point. Okay, and charge, light is coming out here and then propagating to the right. Okay, now look here, here and propagating to the right. Or otherwise, here and going up. Or here and going left. Okay, that's what happens. It's a little bit. Uh, 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 illusionally, it's looked like uh, light, light is going upwards, but synchrotron radiation is <clears throat> the very strong light that comes out from the circular accelerator in the in the tangential direction. And uh, why is it so strong? Well, it's a kind of a shock wave. <laughs> you guys know what shock waves are. You guys know shockwaves are okay. You guys, do you guys know what uh, sonic boom is? Sonic boom is a typical shockwave, right? Have you ever heard of sonic boom? Can you break the sound? Yeah, many fighter jets. Yes, yeah, Indian Air Force is very strong. <laughs> so, so if you yeah, you know, you see a fighter jet coming, yeah. It's coming from far away. You don't hear if it's uh, 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 traveling, uh, flying over the speed of sound. You, you see a, 
an airplane coming, but you don't hear anything. Why is it that you don't hear anything? Yeah? That, that's right. We don't hear anything because the plane is faster than the sound. And uh, when the plane passes above it, us, all of a sudden we hear boom. You hear a sudden boom. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Why do you hear this boom at the, at the beginning? Yeah, that's because, well, the airplane is always emitting light. I'm uh, sorry, emitting uh, 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 sound, okay? But the sound, the air, if the plane is as fast or as, as a little faster than the, the speed of sound, the sound wave can't get in front of get ahead of the, the plane, but it accumulates there in front of where that plane is. It keeps accumulating, it keeps adding, keeps, uh, uh, the more sound comes out, it doesn't go ahead, it keeps adding up without going, going forward, forward from the plane, it keeps adding up right there, okay? So it becomes a great the, a great uh, yeah, intensity of sound uh, in front uh, in front uh, of the plane or uh, uh, as the shock wave uh, 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 approaches the uh, ground. So uh, you see the intense band, and uh, that is called the shock wave. Synchrotron radiation <coughs> is a form of shock wave. Mathematically, it is actually a little bit different because with that type, kind of high energy, you, you have to take into account relativistic effects. But in principle, it is a shock wave. And so you get an enormous uh, light in the very high energy region uh, with uh, synchrotron radiation. Enormously strong, strong X-rays. Uh, high energy ultraviolet light and X-rays. That's what you get from synchrotron radiation, and that's why why it's important. Uh, what, uh, why do you want such a big uh, cumbersome facility just for producing light? Because you want strong high energy light that lasers cannot produce. Okay, lasers, wonderful light sources, but the major limitation of lasers is that it can produce light only mostly in the visible region just a little bit into the near ultraviolet and another little bit in the near infrared and that's all okay uh, when it comes to high energy x-rays uh, you have what's called uh, an x-ray tube or x-ray generator in hospitals but uh, they are so weak, okay? They are so weak. It's like, uh, uh, well, in terms of the number of photons, the X-rays generated by the uh, X-ray machine in the hospital is is as strong as the uh, visible light that comes out from fireflies. Do you know fireflies? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, the X-ray generator at, at the hospital is a firefly. And uh, you're taking picture with the light of a firefly fly at uh, hospitals. That's why it takes a certain exposure time. But, but although in recent years the uh, the detection is extremely sensitive, so it's not too bad. But uh, it can take can take an instantaneous picture, like <laughs> in the visible region. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's what we do with. Uh, sorry. Okay, uh, with, uh, that's what, how, uh, I just want, one moment. I just wanted to show you one more. Uh, okay, I, I like to show that to you because this is uh, really not available to you, uh, unfortunately. I hope uh, it becomes available soon. Let's look at what's called uh, undulator. Uh, 
Uh, okay, this is the undulator radiation. I should probably explain what this is all about. Well, uh, in synchron radiation sources, yeah, so the lot, electrons keep going around the facility. And, uh, well, there are many bending magnets with vertical magnetic fields along the facility. That's why the electron goes around. Okay, but there are some sections between those electromagnets deliberately kept long and empty. Why would you do anything like that? Well, well you can imagine something like a racetrack. Yeah, okay, you have a long straight section. Oh, yeah. Why would you want to have anything of that sort? Because you want to fit in there what's called undulators. Okay? And what is an undulator? It is a section in which you have an array of magnets. Array of magnets lined up. One pointing up, another down, up, down, up, down, up, down, periodically. Okay? Uh, and uh, sandwiching the electron trajectory, okay? So you have N, S, and then S, N, and then N, S. You have a sandwich, and, it, and, and in between goes an electron. Okay, so how do you think an electron will move if it goes through an, a periodic array? Yeah. Well, magnetic field accelerates moving particles. Uh, maybe not all of you have known about it, but if you have a vertical magnetic field, okay, the electron going through it is accelerated sideways. Okay, that's why actually if you have a huge magnet, you can have a circular orbit of uh, a charged particle. That's actually called cyclotron motion. But anyway, uh, you have a vertical magnetic field and the electron is going to be bent this way. And then, then, yeah, 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 like a snake. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So it goes like quick, like this, and then the uh, magnetic field reverses, so it goes like this, and like this, and like this. Okay, so it goes, it wiggles. Like a wave? Like a wave, exactly. It wiggles like a wave. And uh, this is what it's, I believe, this is what it's showing. And you, you see, uh, well, you don't see the wiggles uh, very clearly, but the electron is going through that, uh, yeah, wiggling trajectory. And each, each time it goes through the wiggle, it uh, emits synchrotron radiation, and then again synchrotron radiation, and again synchrotron radiation. So, it uh, accumulates, uh, well, I said synchrotron radiation is an accumulation of uh, wave fronts, but uh, uh, it uh, keeps accumulates uh, even more and more of that uh, along the way. And this is a very, very strong light, light source. Okay, and this is kind of the light that I use. What do I use it for? For taking out electrons from the very center of the uh, uh, the, of the atoms and digging out uh, what's what's fun about digging out an electron from the very center of the atom oh uh, because well if you dig out and uh, and uh, kick, kick out an electron from the center what is going to be left there is going to be a hole hole left in the uh, uh, in the atom okay what happens next if you create a hole Huh? It will, try to fill it. it will try to fill it. How? By adding electron. What? By adding electron. By adding adding electrons. From other atoms. Ah, valence electrons, yeah. Other atoms are far away. So it has to fill it within itself. So a valence electron or intermediate shell electron will go down into the yeah, that's right. And when it does that, what happens? 
There's a lot of energy involved in going down. Energy energy will be released. Okay, energy will be released. And if you and uh, some people said uh, light will be emitted. That may happen. Okay. If you have a if you have an excitation of the valence electron, okay, outside electron, when it de, de excites, all light is going to come out. All this. But 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 if you have an inner shell hole and the outer shell hole is going to have, uh, fall down into it, it's not necessarily light that gets in it to emit it to get rid of the energy. Okay. Uh, well, the electron can decide to emit light by falling down, but he, he can decide something more nasty, like kicking out another electron, outer shell electron or something, to get rid of the <laughs> extra energy. So that's a radiationless transition, okay? It's called OG process, A-U-G-E-R process. Okay, and uh, uh, and uh, that happens more often than not if you excite the inner shell. That's because it happens through the Coulomb interaction, the wiggling and pushing and knocking out between the electrons. Okay, that and Coulomb interaction is strong, so OJ is more likely to happen than the emission of a photon, emission of light. Emission of light is actually, if you are, put yourself in, uh, if you are an electron, it isn't exactly all that easy. In order to emit light, you have to couple with vacuum, okay? You have to couple with vacuum in creating something new in vacuum called the photon. Okay, and that's actually a fairly difficult <coughs> process. If something much easier, like kicking out an electron, is possible, another electron is possible. So, yeah, uh, excite an inner shell electron and the OJ process happens. Okay, yeah, and the OJ happens so a photo, the original first electron can go out. Yeah, with synchrotron radiation. Yeah, that I blast on it. And then an OJ electron can go out. And then, uh, then what happen What is left there? Oh, you have a few holes now because you have a, a, not just one but two holes. Oh, okay. What happens then? Maybe an outer shell electron. A couple of them will go into that two holes. And then what happens? Maybe there will be a few more holes in the uh, uh, in, in the outer shells, and a few more electrons might go out. And the yeah, electron might the atom might keep spinning out electrons all by itself, and uh, a heavy one like a krypton, if you remove the one s electron, the the deepest electron, okay, the deepest electron. Oh, it can after that automatically spin out, yeah, uh, spin out uh, nine or ten electrons, becoming a <laughs> highly charged uh, krypton ion. Wow, and uh, that kind of process, yeah, uh, the uh, kicking out of uh, atoms and uh, electrons by, uh, uh, by fighting with each other, you might say, and uh, then even as the, uh, as the electrons go out, you can see them, uh, well, in a way colliding, or a heat being taken over, or exchanging energy, and all sorts of things. It's a complicated and interesting playground of electrons that happens uh, immediately, uh, around, right around the electron, uh, sorry, atom. And that's called the post-collision interaction effect. And that's the kind of study that I do. Okay. I think I'm already running over time, but uh, yeah. Uh, uh, how much time can I possibly have? Uh, regarding Japanese science and, uh, uh, well, since uh, I, should, I should perhaps say a few things, uh, at least. Thank <laughs> you.
Yeah, this, this represents a simple picture. Uh, synchron radiation photon kicks uh, an electron out, and then the, the hole, uh, the another electron goes into the hole, kicking out yet another outer shell electron. Okay, and uh, well, okay, maybe just uh, I'll say a few things. Why? I'm very often at, just one moment. I. Well, I just like to ask to present to you. Uh, One of the questions that I most often receive from my colleagues and some of the students, why was Japan's modernization the earliest and most successful among the non-Western nations? Well, uh, uh, well, uh, if you're talking about the fa until the fairly recent past, well, uh, Japan was the only mo uh, non-Western uh, uh, nation with a uh, uh, very well developed uh, heavy industry and he and uh, 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 standard life and all that. Uh, well, modernization, industrialization, westernization, are they synonymous or not? That's a very good question uh, that, uh, that that can be well debated. Let's I, I, but, uh, let's uh, uh, not get into details uh, and technologies about that. The simple answer, well, if you have a simple mind, the simple answer is that uh, it's basically because Japan was not colonized. That was a very, uh, very important factor. It did not suffer from Western imperialism, fortunately. Instead, it tried to join the imperialist, imperialist bandwagon. Well, unfortunately, for some, uh, some other perspective, uh, although that was very brief. And why was it not colonized? The geography was perhaps most important. Yes, uh, India was uh, a bit uh, considerably uh, much closer to uh, the Western world ge geographically. And uh, well, uh, China was a bit further, but uh, not, uh, it, it also uh, suffered uh, quite heavily. And uh, uh, the uh, while uh, uh, Japan did not. And uh, that's important, but uh, also important is the fact that uh, the culture of social development in the Edo period, that is the period from the 16th century to the early 19th century, uh, that was also important. Uh, they uh, completely shut off the uh, uh, influences of, of outside world and developed a very close-knit uh, in, in a way that they didn't have a modern industry, but a very sophisticated infrastructure, trade, and the economic uh, 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 organization. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and then uh, it suddenly opened up the country and, uh, in, and uh, tried to uh, modernize, so to say, in a real rush, uh, 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 consciously, on its own choice. Uh, not not enforced like many of our uh, age, other Asian brothers and sisters, uh, and uh, this was uh, well. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm showing you a, a, a slide that I should often show it to uh, uh, ordinary, ordinary audience. Stuff. Yeah, uh, the 300 years of peace and stability was actually quite. Uh, that was the time. It, 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 Japan was actually fairly affluent while the Westerners were just fighting war after war. They were peaceful and uh, uh, domestic uh, 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 and domestic stability and, uh, uh, and development of society was actually substantial. And uh, and uh, compared to India, 
Uh, Japan is monolingual, only one language, monocultural, uh, very monolithic society. Yes, of course, India is very, very interesting because of its diversity. But of course, as you all know, there's a lot of challenges because of that. So interesting, and so if you can hop, harvest the good aspects of it, it's great. But of course, that's very difficult. In Jap the Japanese did not have very much of that, uh, difficulties in, in that respect. And uh, the strict uh, uh, feudalism, yeah, considered inside, uh, from some point, the points, uh, feudalism may be considered backwards, but actually very intricate and sophisticated social system uh, and developed. And uh, in particular, the samurai worry, warrior class uh, uh, had this uh, strong uh, sense of chivalry and discipline and loyalty. And, and these were the leading uh, ruling class. And unlike the ruling class of many other uh, other uh, uh, civilization, the ruling class, this, uh, they were the warrior class and very frugal and modest. Uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, the farmers uh, uh, ha were, were very meek, uh, uh, lived in meek obedience and uh, diligence, uh, where the virtues were instilled as moral values. Uh, well, of course, good and bad, and uh, uh, you can say all sorts of things about it. But uh, uh, the the their. Uh, uh, and the artisans uh, were also respected and uh, had pride in the development of the skill and uh, uh, the uh, inheritance of the skill to the generation. Education uh, was uh, uh, important for all classes. And, uh, uh, and actually, the merchants were considered to be the lowest cost in Japan because they didn't produce anything uh, in terms of material. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, uh, they became more and more affluent and uh, became uh, 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 ruling influence even over the samurai class. And the major restoration happened in 1868. Uh, with, and uh, well, uh, the, all the details, uh, uh, well, I, I just leave out all the uh, details. It was the great leap forward uh, uh, movement uh, and westernization prevailed over the traditional isolationism and uh, extremely, extremely strong uh, resolve to copy Western civilization and join the imperialism bandwagon. And uh, uh, which is, well, some people may not like it, but uh, the Japanese perceived it as the only way to survive, okay, and not be uh, defeated, overcome by the Westerners. Uh, is to become like Westerners themselves. <laughs> yes. And uh, the, so uh, the, well, I think I'm running over time. Uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, over time, so uh, uh, let's just uh, 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 tell you that the high spirit of the Meiji era, uh, the dev devotion to the high cause, was very uh, strong and uh, implicit in the training of especially of former samurais. And they sort of uh, studied uh, with a kind of resolve, such as uh, the uh, famous, uh, you know, actually a, a later bureaucrat and the military bureaucrat, bureaucrat Sani and Kiyakiyama, uh, says that, uh, neglecting my studies one day means delaying the progress of my nation by one day. Yeah, so that sort of uh, strong resolve and uh, uh, the uh, uh, awareness of mission was uh, 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 was uh, uh, also instrumental to the modernization of the the, the, ja uh, the Japanese. And uh, I have to say, this was a tradition that was rooted in the samurai ethics, the traditional samurai ethics 
of Japan. And uh, so, uh, and so, it is interesting to note that the traditional virtues and values were actually important for the so-called modernization of Westernization or Westernization of Japan. And uh, this uh, kind of culture uh, does not really exist anywhere nearly as strongly as it used to in the uh, in the fairly recent past anymore. Okay, so uh, the Japanese, the future of the Japanese is uh, uh, actually uh, going to be quite interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'm. Uh, 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 I, I should stop around here, but uh, I often talk about the difference in the past uh, cultural psychology of the West, uh, uh, West yeah. the Westerners, uh, Western uh, exchange of critical inquiry, the development of the science or, or any other discipline by the exchange of critical inquiry is supposed to be uh, essential. Well, the Japanese do not think of it as com especially confrontational uh, critical discourse. Uh, it's uh, uh, not very popular in Japan, but uh, the Japanese uh, tend to learn more by assimilation with strong emphasis on procedure. Okay, result is important, but the uh, uh, Japanese uh, take, uh, has a strong, uh, all those places a strong emphasis on the procedure in which things are done, the attitude in which the things are done, and the spirit. And uh, uh, some of them get carried out uh, uh, so, so much uh, uh, about the attitude and procedure, even more, even more than the result, <laughs> which is uh, an interesting cultural uh, perspective. The India. Uh, exemplified by what's called jagat in good ways and bad ways, uh, and emphasize on quick and tangible results achieved by any means. That is interesting. Yeah, uh, the Japanese are also uh, they always insist on proper means and proper methods rather than any means. And uh, but uh, uh, the openness of the Indians, however, actually uh, and also be uh, a strength. And uh, openness and lenience to towards uh, yeah different ideas. Uh, well, this was a necessary attitude, of course, developed because you have to uh, deal with uh, very different people within India. Uh, uh, India uh, alone, yeah, uh, and uh, because of that necessity. Uh, many of the Indian people speak English very well. That's one of the things that the Japanese don't speak English all that well, unfortunately. Only Japanese. And uh, England, you guys, you guys all speak English so well. It's incredible. But that's not all. You guys speak, of course, speak Hindi and Urdu and Bengali and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all sorts of uh, languages that you guys are familiar uh, with uh, and interested in. And uh, this is, uh, in a way, a lot more of a challenge than the Japanese had. Mm. But I'm confident that uh, 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 things will be overcome and the uh, great achievements will be made by India in the future. The recent success in uh, uh, launching this uh, spaceship to uh, uh, to uh, to moon was the moon was very impressive. Nice. I was very impressed by the Chandrayaan, not so much just by the ro rocket technology. Spaceship technology is well in itself not really cutting edge. It's uh, uh, well this the Russians put Sputnik in space in the 1950s already. Uh, the, but uh, this kind of uh, uh, so sophisticated project like the Chandrayaan, okay, uh, with, uh, with uh, multi-purpose in space, uh, could be uh, uh, launched with, uh, uh, with, could be executed successfully only with the coordination of so many things. Actually, not, not cutting edge is important, but actually not all cutting edge. Uh, rocket ship technology is fairly well established. What was really important in a mission like that was that the medium level 
on the modest level, technology is very well tuned and reliable. And, uh, and so many components have to be uh, working uh, in, uh, in unison and, and so many things have to have the uh, uh, uniform excellent quality. Okay, and uh, well, India is uh, today excellent with very high tech and their, and their geniuses in physics, but I always felt this mid, uh, refinement of this middle level technology was uh, a rather weak point in India. But the general Ayan, I think, exemplifies the success uh, in part, of course, of the highest technology, but the uh, uh, progress India has made in coordinating uh, more modest, medium level uh, technology in a large scale, in a strict manner. And, uh, uh, and uh, well, uh, I, I'm uh, confident that many of you guys, I don't know whether some of you are geniuses, you will like, work at the top, or at, uh, or actually, statistically speaking, some of you will work at more at the modest, medium level and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, really contribute to the future great development of uh, technology and science in India. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm impressed by your mathematical dexterity. Uh, at IIT, uh, I find that many of my students are, at least, uh, if, uh, if you consider the mathematical ability alone, many of the students are better than I am. Yeah, I'm afraid. <laughs> yes, and uh, yeah, Indian education, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, one more comment. I'm, I'm extremely impressed by the number of female science students in India. Oh, I still see a good name, number of girls, number of girls here. I hope you do well, and uh, yeah. This is a, an area that actually India is quite far ahead of Japan. Yeah, uh, in Japan, uh, 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 women in science, especially in physics are so few <laughs> and, uh, and uh, well they are having a uh, real struggle in improving the situation yeah mm -hmm. well yeah i hope you will do uh, some of you will take the uh, J exam uh, well i have a lot of things to say about it but uh, well i'm i'm just sure that uh, uh, many of you will uh, manage well <laughs> and the yeah, and today Japan has plentiful facilities, apparatus with insufficient human resources, I'm afraid, both quality, quantity and quality. The population is dwindling and the human resource situation is getting worse. India, on the other hand, is a huge reservoir of human resources, some of them extremely high quality, like you guys, or like you guys in the future. <laughs> and uh, facilities are getting much better, but still needs a lot of catching up. I think in the future, Japan is going to need India more than India needs Japan. And uh, various issues regarding cultural compatibility needs to be looked on. They looked into there's a big difference between the uh, extremely uh, diverse uh, society and culture. Uh, like in the, and the monolithic uh, uh, culture of Japan. Okay, well, I think I really talked over a time, yes, and uh, well, uh, it's uh, been a pleasure of, uh, to talk to you. I think it was so much fun. Uh, I, I, I hope you enjoyed. Yes, and uh, well, uh, good luck with your future, and many of you, I'm hoping that many of you might become research scientists, and I hope you enjoy your science, okay? Thank you very much.